as we open God's word together for the preaching of the gospel, let's ask God to open our hearts in prayer. Living God, we bow before you and we confess vain is the word of man. We can't keep our promises. We can't bring life to the dead. But as we bow before you, this we confess with great confidence and joy. Mighty and powerful is the word of God. So speak your word now and penetrate every heart with the light and the life that is in your word, in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I'd ask you to open your Bibles to John chapter 11. We're going to read from John 11 and John 12, and it's my real joy this morning to preach the gospel to you. The Bible reading this morning is going to be relatively long. And the sermon this morning is going to be relatively short. And that's okay because the word of man always has the potential to flub things up and not get the job done. But the word of God always gets the job done. As we prepare to read, and we're going to start in John 11, verse 38, where Jesus comes to his friend's tomb after his friend just died. But as we prepare to read, we're going to start in John 11, verse 38. We're going to read down through the middle of chapter 12. But as we prepare to read the word of God, I would just challenge you to consider what is the word of God? What is the word of God? I don't think we think about that nearly enough. The Bible begins with the word of God. God said, God spoke, let there be what? Light. What is the word of God? The word of God is, there was nothing to respond to the word of God when God spoke, let there be light. There wasn't this principle or this essence called light wasting time in the corner tavern. And when God said, let there be light, it kind of woke up and came out to do its job. There was no such thing as light. And God spoke, let there be light, and light was. What is the word of God? There's nothing more fundamental to reality than the word of God. There's not some basic essence or some basic nature and the word of God sort of fixes it. There is nothing and God's word creates. This is God's word. Let the power of God's word ring in your ears and most importantly echo in your heart as we read his word. John chapter 11, verse 38, and we're going to read through the middle of chapter 12. Jesus comes to this tomb, and it says, Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Verse 39 of chapter 11. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there'll be an odor, for he's been dead for four days. And Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God. So they took away the stone and Jesus lifted his eyes up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. Look at what he says. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around in order that they may believe that you sent me. And when he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the man who had died came out, his hands and his feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped up with a cloth. And Jesus said to him, unbind him and let him go. 
Look at the response. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, what are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everybody will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all. Watch what he says, verse 50. Nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. I think John is accurately recording what Caiaphas said, but I think John is also hearkening us back to John 3.16. It's amazing how he does that. Verse 51, he did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation and not only for the nation, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they made plans to put Jesus to death. Jesus therefore no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there to the region near the wilderness to a town called Ephraim. And there he stayed with his disciples. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and many went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. They were looking for Jesus and saying to one another as they stood in the temple, what do you think, that he will not come to the feast at all? Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he should let them know so that they might arrest him. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. Mary, therefore, took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus. You see that? And wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of that perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this, not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial, burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. And the next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, fear not daughter of Zion, behold your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they had heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing? Look, the whole world has gone after him. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks meaning the world, meaning non-Jewish people, some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. And Philip went and told Andrew, and Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus, and Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. 
Whoever loves his life loses it. Whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. What a passage from God's word recording the works and the words of Jesus. May the power of God's word sink into every heart and even change lives according to the will of God in these moments we have together. Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead and then Jesus says to the sister of Lazarus, if anyone believes in me, he will live even after his death. And then coming from the burial and the graveside, Jesus enters this feast and Mary anoints his feet for his burial. And Jesus even says, there'll always be poor people, but I won't always be here, meaning that soon he himself will be in a tomb. And Jesus is becoming so popular I don't know if you heard the grumbling of the Pharisees, the religious leaders. Jesus is becoming so popular that, they're, that his enemies are saying things like, the whole world is going after him. If we don't shut him down right now and right quick, we're going to lose everything. And it's in that setting where these Greeks from the world come to, to the disciples and say, we want to see Jesus. His, his works and his words really are making the difference that the word of God always makes. And it's in this moment, it's in this moment in the narrative when Jesus says, what is it, verse 23? Now is the hour. Now is the hour for the son of man to be glorified. John's gospel has been clicking toward the hour since John chapter 2 when the first miracle, the first t a little time stamp toward the hour happened. And now Jesus says, now is the hour. But look what he says. He's coming from a tomb. He's anointed for his burial, but he does not say now is the, now is the hour for the son of man to be buried. He doesn't even say now is the time for the son of man to die. Why would he say now is the time for the son of man to be glorified? Church, you understand why? It's because his death on that cross was glorious. If him bleeding for you and me wasn't glorious, I don't have any clue what glory is. It's because the glorification of Jesus includes at least these three movements that are all seen as one, his crucifixion, his resurrection, and his ascension. And he says, now is the hour of glory. We understand that the, the cross was the most humiliating, shameful way for anyone to die, and it's appropriate. Like, we're going to have a Good Friday service. Uh, Brennan invited everyone to it. We're going to have a Good Friday service here on Friday, and there'll be um, somber music, and we'll reflect on the agonies that Christ went through. The death on the cross is shameful, and yet Jesus says... It's the hour for him to be glorified. So this is the first paradox of what? About four. In verse 23, he says that the hour of his death is the hour of his glory. And then in verse 24, he says that unless a grain of wheat dies, it won't really live a thousand times. But if it dies, it'll live in a huge harvest. That's the second paradox. And then the third paradox is in the very next verse. He says, if you love your life and try to hold on to it, it'll squeak out of your hands like a water balloon. But if you hate your life, you'll keep it for life eternal. And then there's another paradox in verse 26 when he says, if you serve Jesus, you'll be honored. In a culture where servants were never honored, Jesus says the servant will be honored by God himself. We have, this, we have this cascade of all these paradoxes that Jesus lays out because of the hour of his glory. The hour of his glory. As this hour has come, Jesus explains paradoxically that everything changes because of his death and everything changes in our life because of his death 
And so he says, unless you lose your life, you'll never live it. Unless you hate your life in this world, you'll never keep it to life eternal, all because of his death. You notice the illustration that he gives about his death in verse 24, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Sometimes a preacher or a teacher has like a, 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 a what do you call it? Like a prop or something to show. Even if I did have a grain of wheat in my hand, you wouldn't be able to tell. <laughs> too little, too little. Grain of wheat. You hold a grain of wheat in your hand. Can you see that grain of wheat if it's right there in your hand? I suppose you say, yeah, I can see it. I can see it in my hand. But Jesus almost would say to you, no, you can't. No, you can't. Because what that grain of wheat is meant to be by the creative power of the word of God, the converting power of the word of God, that grain of wheat is not meant to be a grain of wheat that you can see in your hand. That grain of wheat is meant to be a field filled with nourishing plants that will bring more and more life to so many other people. That's what that grain of wheat really is. But unless, but unless, it remains a grain of wheat that isn't what it's meant to be unless it, so to speak, dissolves in the ground, dies in the ground, and then bears much fruit. You see the meaning of this paradox in the context. It's set up by first the Pharisees whining about the fact that the whole world is coming after Jesus and so they better murder him and put him in a tomb like Lazarus was in a tomb. Good luck with that. We see how he raised Lazarus from the dead. Jesus himself won't stay dead. He'll rise three days later. But the Pharisees are whining about the whole world going after him. And then at the feast of the Passover, these non-Jewish Greeks are coming to him and the world really is inquiring about him. And when Jesus hears the rumors and Jesus see, meets these non-Jews, Jesus understands that he himself must fulfill the will of the creative power of God and be buried in the ground so that he can bring forth a harvest. And I know that that harvest that Jesus speaks of, you... You saw little ones up here this morning. Them, their families, they're a part of that harvest. This church is a part of that harvest. We have the signups out there for the missions conference. You come to uh, a couple weeks after Easter, you, you come to our missions conference and you will hear. You will hear from, from folks that we, that, that we support both here and a long way away overseas who are bringing forth that harvest all because the seed went into the ground. <laughs> And now it bears much fruit. But would you notice that Jesus first talks about himself in verse 24, and then he talks about you in verses 25 and 26. He says in verse 26, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. The reason Jesus talks not only about himself, but about us is because Jesus came and spoke he did, his, he did his works and he spoke his words so that we would follow him. That's why he came. He came to make that difference. He came so that we would follow him. Following is a simple concept. A child knows how to follow their parent or their grandma or their grandpa. The soldier knows how to follow his commanding officer. The student knows how to follow the instructions that the teacher writes out or explains Notice that the truth that Jesus says about himself, that he has to die so that he can bear much fruit, notice Jesus transfers that paradoxical truth to you and to me if we are his followers. We too have a death and we too have a hatred so that we too can lead to a love and a fruit. The truth about Jesus in verse 24 becomes a truth about everyone who follows him in verses 25 and 26. And I hope you can understand and even appreciate, even though it's demanding, that every self-revelation of Jesus is also a confrontation to those to whom he reveals himself. 
That's more of the power of the word of God. It's meant to be unignorable. Every self-revelation of Jesus is a confrontation to those who would follow him because Jesus says, follow me. What I'm saying about myself, that you've got to follow too. Every self-revelation of Jesus is meant to be the, the, almost the, the strongest challenge that you can ever receive and also the sweetest promise of life that you can ever receive, both at the same time, both at the same time. The cross is the way of death. He did die on that cross, but the cross is the way of life. We are forgiven and set free by that cross. And so when Jesus says, follow me, it is true that he bids a man to come and die as he did. But there is a resurrection life on the other side of that death. Jesus says, follow me. Where I am, there will my servant be also. You notice it's almost a little confusing how he talks about hating your life. Why would we want to hate life? Verse 25, whoever loves his life loses it. Whoever hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. What is it? Are Christians supposed to be people that hate life? Well, how do you hate your life? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not even asking the question rightly because we need to pay a little bit closer attention to the text. You see what it says. Whoever loves his life loses it and whoever hates his life in this world. Don't miss that little locative, that little prepositional phrase, in this world. Hating your life doesn't mean hating yourself and hating your life. Hating your life, according to Jesus here, means hating your life in this world. Why would you hate your life in this world? The reason why, and, and it only makes sense if there are things about life in this world that would get in the way of a better life in that world. And you don't hate your life in this world because all followers of Jesus are filled with hatred. You hate your life in this world because all followers of Jesus are certain, be, be, certain beyond verbalization that there is a better life coming. And whatever we give up in this life, we will be more than gaining, just like that little seed goes into a thousand plants. The same way, whatever we give up in this life, we gain in real abundant life in Jesus. So when a preacher preaches the gospel and says you have to believe in Jesus, which I'm saying, you have to repent of your sin, which I'm saying, it is that you have to hate this life in the sense of the pride, the vanity, the sin that holds you back from Jesus so that you can have a real greater abundant life. Here's how a Christian prays about living life. I hope you pray this way. Here's how a Christian prays about living life and loving life. Christian just prays, Jesus, you have saved me and you gave your life for me and you brought me from sin and death into life. Jesus, you did that for me. So Jesus, anything in this life that gets between me and you, I'm done with it. I'm done with it. Anything in this life that helps me to follow you more closely, I'm committed to it. I'm committed to it. You see? That's the love. That's the drawing power of Jesus that leads you in hate of turning your back on Jesus to repent of your sin. But it's driven by love. Anything that keeps me from obeying Jesus, it gets cut out. Anything I can't hold on to while I'm going the way of Jesus, I let go of which is just another way of saying that every command Jesus gives is for our ultimate good and our ultimate glory in him. And everything Jesus forbids, he forbids it so that we would not harm ourselves eternally even unto the second death. So repent of your sin. Repent of your sin. Say, Jesus, I'm, I'm done steering my own ship. I need a Lord, a pilot, a master. This is the call to faith and repentance. You see, Jesus knows that sinners need to be forgiven. Maybe we all know that sinners need to be forgiven, but Jesus knows it for sure that sinners need to be forgiven. And Jesus knows something that we often forget. And that is that 
self-centered people, they always end up miserable. Jesus knows that. People who hug their own life, they, they, they push against anything that gets in their way, self-centered, selfish people that insist on their own way all the time, they always end up isolated and miserable. Repentance is to be done with my refusal to follow Jesus. Repentance is, is to be done with my, 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 my doing everything on my own and living as if I'm my own Lord. And repentance says, Jesus is Lord. And beloved church, this is the gospel. 1 Peter 3.18, for Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, in order that he might bring us to God. 2 Corinthians 5, for God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus, perfect God, perfect man, not deserving death, sinless. He died as a substitute or in the place of all those who would be that harvest and who would believe and who would follow him. The good news of the gospel is that sinners can be saved by a substitute, by his life, by his death, and by his resurrection. Jesus went to the cross when he was alive, but when they took him from the cross, he was dead. If you would come to Jesus Christ really and truly today, if you would come to Jesus Christ really and truly today, what would happen is you would realize, I, I've been living something that I called life, but that life, that Jesusless life, that life where I'm my own Lord, that has to die. That has to die so that now I can live in Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord. If you come to Christ, some things in your life will get killed and buried. Things like sin, self-destruction, vanity, pride. But when you bury those things, you won't end up missing them you'll realize that through Jesus Christ and his resurrection, there's life and it's all gain on the other side. So come to Christ, repent of your sin, believe on Jesus and be saved. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we trust in the power of your word, read spoken, preached, would you bring life? Would you bring life by the very proclamation of your word so that many would see and follow Jesus into life eternal? In Jesus' name we pray, amen.